Good morning. It's Thursday, February 17th. It's 9.29 a.m. Uh, we're reconvening the Senate Natural Resources and Energy Committee to continue our work on S-148, an act relating to environmental justice in Vermont. Um, and we're continuing our tour of different operating areas to see, to learn more about um, the two things. One, the current practices and how uh, related to environmental justice and particularly how S-148 might be incorporated into the work and the impact it might have on the work of each operating area. So with that, uh, good morning, Secretary French. I think this might be the first time I've had the pleasure of your company in Senate Natural Resources and Energy. Um, I don't know if you've had a chance to uh, review the bill and think about how this will unfold. It's over a period of years, but it seems like um, the, the world of education will be influenced by this. Yes, good morning. And for the record, Dan French, Secretary of Education. And uh, yes, it's uh, refreshing to be in a different committee of jurisdiction and yet see a lot of familiar faces. Um, I have had a chance to read through the bill, so I, I did not have a chance to provide uh, my comments in a written form, so I apologize, but I'll, I'll just make some uh, oral comments and reaction to the language and, and to your point, uh, provide some uh, comments on the operating environment education and, and this bill's relevance to that. Um, Certainly with the pandemic, as you can imagine, that's that's our primary focus right now, and particularly as we're contemplating sort of coming into the endemic phase of that. And um, what we talk about in education is being education recovery work, uh, which will be uh, several years to say the least. But um, my immediate reaction to the bill really, in terms of recovery, focuses on our work in school facilities. Um, you know, I, what we worked on last year because of the influx of federal dollars coming in through a program called ESSER, you might be familiar with ESSER, that's the primary federal relief uh, funding source for schools, trying to um, leverage those dollars to the maximum extent possible to address uh, some of the facilities issues. Uh, you know, like all federal COVID relief dollars, they have to be tagged to uh, the pandemic. And there's a lot of issues that sort of... Uh, transcend our longstanding facilities issues also with indoor air quality and so forth. So we are able to work with school districts to advance a lot of work and leverage these dollars, but that's taken a lot of, I'll, I'll refer to a coherence making on our part. Um, and last year, the General Assembly enacted Act 72, which I think is a, is a good description of that coherence making effort on both the part of the agency of education and the General Assembly to kind of bring pieces together of policy work that uh, predate the pandemic, but also trying to situate that work in a way that would allow us and allow school districts to use their federal dollars uh, to the maximum potential. So Act 72 is a good starting point for that. We also have, you know, other sort of called one-off issues uh, like PCBs, for example, or lead and drinking water um, that uh, have to be situated in that context that don't necessarily align uh, with ESSER or sort of the federal COVID uh, requirements. Um, and it's not clear to me, you know, so the, the theme here with Act 72 is like how to, how to bring coherence to the work. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done, which I'll, I'll describe in more detail. But my first reaction to this, I'm, I'm not sure, um, you know, is this bill the, or this topic, the larger framing issue that would allow school districts to move forward? Or is it the framing of this post COVID environment that allows us to sort of address indoor air quality and some of those issues. So I'm, I struggle, uh, I think we're all struggling as leaders at this time to kind of frame things out in a coherent sort of way. Um, it's not clear to me to what extent this bill would be that larger framing or would it be perceived as yet another layer of things to do um, so I'm still working on trying to how sure. to intersect these things together. Right. But I thought I thought I would talk a little bit about some of that historical context with schools um, in terms of your your prompt around the operating area. So we've had you know a moratorium on school construction aid since 2007. Uh, that's led to a lot of backlog of projects. Uh, but in a parallel track, we also have a lot of deferred maintenance in schools. And there's a, there's a relationship between what's defined as school construction and maintenance, oftentimes maintenance issues, uh, if they're not attended to, become uh, manifest in a construction project. So since 2007, we haven't had that funding, and that's led to a lot of uh, school facilities issues. On a parallel uh, observation, the AOE, the Agency of Education, also at its height had three staff dedicated to school construction, and we now have none. We haven't had any staff dedicated to school facilities for, for over a decade. Um, 
my budget proposal this year does include uh, one position, and I'm also seeking to transfer uh, another position from another place of the agency. So we, and I think uh, many, what we call SEA, state education agencies, one of the reactions to the pandemic that we see emerging nationally is an acknowledgement that SEAs need to be more directly involved in the school facilities. So we're, you know, Act 72 is sort of the beginning of that. As a result of the pandemic, we're, we're really uh, putting as a priority our building capacity inside the agency of education to have more direct responsibility and oversight of school facilities and also provide more support to school districts in that regard. Um, so we're, we're building capacity in that regard. I did not have this bill on my radar relative to assessing our need for capacity. So I'll just call out that, um, you know, there is a requirement for community engagement plans and managing it, you know, so pretty it appears to me fairly uh, robust reporting requirement under this bill. Um, I'd have to do some evaluation to what extent additional staff would be needed at the agency. But, you know, last year with all the new federal dollars coming in, we had many new uh reporting requirements and councils and commissions established. And uh, that's put a strain on our, our ability to manage a lot of the pandemic work. So I'd have to figure out how that would be situated. Uh, to your point, this is a sort of a long-term strategy. So that's something perhaps that could be addressed over time. Right. Um, one specific... a, sorry to interrupt. It's definitely a phase development with yep. like ANR pushing ahead first on rulemaking and uh, the community engagement process. And then I think, you know, this is one of those learn from others who are going ahead so that it will sort of the, the dropping the pebble in the pond and the ripple travels out throughout gotcha. uh, without any expectation that it's instantaneous in every agency for sure. Yeah, that, you know, that's, I guess my theme is that this would have to be situated relative to the, you know, for us, the priority work uh, on endemic and, you know, managing uh, the recovery work in our schools, which will be several years at least. Um, on the point on rulemaking, I did notice in, I think, a section uh, 6003, the rulemaking part, um, it has a sort of reacting, the agency of education reacting by updating policies, guidance, uh, rules. I just wanted to point out for those that aren't as familiar with the education space that uh, the agency of education does not engage in rulemaking. Uh, that's a function of the state board of education. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have uh, the general assembly did ask the agency of education and the state board to uh, contemplate changes to that structure uh, and roles we call roles and responsibilities between the agency of education and the state board. That report is coming to the General Assembly literally as we speak. The State Board voted on its final draft of that yesterday. Um, so that's that's a topic uh, that would have to be sorted out specific to uh, the education space. Um, but that's currently not something that the agency itself has authority over. Okay. Um, yeah, and lastly, um, the last I'm just basically going through the bill and its order. Uh, the last piece, I just comment on the inter composition of the interagency council. Mm -hmm. um, again, we don't necessarily have staff uh, with that sort of expertise. Um, and we are also historically on an annual basis asked to participate in at least five new councils or commissions. Um, so I'd, I'd want to make sure that we had, you know, value add, so to speak, to bring right. to that conversation. I'm not sure at this point we do. But those that's essentially my comments. I'd be happy to. Okay. Discuss this further. Um, well, thanks for that. Um, so, did did I understand you correctly to say that annually you're requested to join new five new councils or boards? That I seems to be a pattern. I think last year we had more than five. Uh, we have task force and commissions uh, that are, you know, that's that's a common policy reflex on the part of the uh, General Assembly in education. Yeah, and is there another? Uh, is there another? Is there an other end to that pipeline where on an annual basis, five boards or commissions are, are uh, decommissioned and go away? Yeah, I, I would like to think there's light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, I, I think the chair is getting a little bit in, too much into my afternoon. Committee, <laughs> so I think I'll make a point of order. And <clears throat> uh, the assistant could mute any Southern senator on the call. <laughs> I, I would observe they often get extended. Um, you know, I can think of a couple like Act 173, Act 173 advisor group has been renewed a couple times. The Act 1 ethnic studies group has been renewed. Uh, so there is, you know, there tends to be a, a lifeline of these things, certainly. But um, 
what I find is challenging is that there's no, there's no broader perspective other than, you know, the receivers of that good work. No one has their eyes on the impact of to what extent an agency can support, you know, 10 new councils being contemplated at the same time. They tend to come out of the general assembly on a siloized basis. And then as we put it all together, we're like, Oh, this is going to be a challenge. Sure. Um, And, you know, the thing is I've tried to say this to every operating area that we talk with about, legislation and any kind of work that that implementing that bill entails is that we never want to be putting any operating area in the position of simply asking them to do more without adequate support that helps them succeed in doing that work. It shouldn't be uh, merely like a task or a burden, but it, our goal is always that we're doing something that we would mutually perceive as, uh, as beneficial, you know? And so- sure. Uh, To that end, the Joint Fiscal Office will be reaching out to you if you haven't heard from them already to be asking for uh, information as part of them putting together a fiscal note because uh, I think we all sense, we don't know what the bill is yet for this bill, but we know that to to fully implement it will take a period of years and it will require resources for sure. So um, we're not expecting you to do more for without additional any additional support you need yeah no i appreciate that um and our you know senator campion and his committee and our our sister committee in the house have always been very supportive in that regard i think uh, you know coming back to sort of the it's it's good to hear this is uh, sort of the strategic disposition of this versus i'll draw the distinction between tactical versus strategic uh, initiatives yeah. I just, uh, again, it's, it's not clear to me and we're, we're keenly interested in issues of energy and efficiency and improving um, some of the environmental impact of schools that, you know, that those conversations are ones that tend to be more strategic from my perspective, but I think those are ones we'd be happy to participate in and are looking forward uh, to those conversations. I would just point out again that on a tactical or immediate level, which is now a multi-year effort in education recovery as a result of the pandemic, there's a lot in that lane right now. So even when we take up this discrete issue like PCBs, part of what we're hearing from school districts right now is how to situate that, you know, specific and urgent topic in the context of this larger body of work that now is in front of us. Right. Um, and that, that becomes a challenge then to think about the more strategic framing of these types right. of topics. Well, I doubt you ever have time to sort of be reading at your leisure, but if you double back to the definitions, I think in here you'll, so in 6001, environmental benefits and environmental burdens, um, and environmental justice, those three. The, so the definition of environment here, I think one of the things we've learned uh, is that it's a much more expansive definition than sort of the literal environment that we're often addressing in our committee as natural resources. So uh, for instance, with um, uh, safe and you know, healthy and nutritious food. So schools play a vital role in that. Um, access ultimately to uh, um, good employment rule. Schools play a role in that, whether it's sort of an academic path or a career uh, trades path, uh, stuff like that. So I think it is, it is from my understanding, where uh, you were saying, what's the relationship of this to other efforts? I would say, as best I can see, this is the biggest umbrella under which uh, that sort of in broad interpretation of environment will flow through all the, the programs of um, state government. Yeah, I think that's useful uh, in the framing. I, you know, again, I would just point out we have a major legislative initiative on universal school meals right. uh, and locally grown foods. And there's a poverty indicator that was surfaced as part of that. How do we get a better handle on uh, describing poverty levels that connects directly over to the foundational work on the pupil weighting formula. And, you know, so these are all major structural projects that we are trying to build coherence and um, we'll get at the heart of some of these strategic uh, objectives of this policy. Right, right, okay. Um, All right, so uh, I think, you know, uh, are there any committee questions for the secretary or comments? Um, That's very helpful. We, We wish you well, thanks for your um, work leading uh, an area that's been particularly vital to Vermonters during the pandemic, 
And I know that it's, uh, we're not out of the tunnel yet, but, um, done, you know, yeoman's work in a difficult period of time for 80, what, 85,000 kids under your care. So, and, and all the faculty and staff that help them. So thank you for that. Oh, thank you. All right. Um, seeing nothing further, then uh, thanks for your visit. You should be hearing, or one of your colleagues hearing from the Joint Fiscal Office, uh, Julia Richter, if you have not already. And she'll be uh, working to assemble information related to the cost of implementation of the bill. So that's it, really. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Um, so we're a, a little ahead of schedule. So let's take advantage of the time we have before Ms. Davis arrives. And if she comes in, uh, we'll switch over. Um, but I wanted to have a, while we have a few moments, a discussion of where we are on Act 250. So we had uh, the porcupine session yesterday, which was a, a little difficult, but that's fine. I, I'm just trying to, plan a, a path forward where we feel like we can pull together um, uh, a best bill from our perspective. And so one of the things uh, that I, I would say the, something I didn't know in the beginning that seems like one of the most important things I've learned, and I'd love to hear more from you, is um, that we're talking about housing and ARPA funded housing. And if we simply adopt the rules uh, related to priority housing projects, that I think that the contribution um, may be more modest than we would like. So I'll be more specific, affordable rental units under PH, the PHP rules right now require affordability only for 15 years. In 2007, it was 30 years. In 2014, it got reduced to 20 years. In 2017, it got reduced to 15 years. So we had an explanation about how PHPs don't receive um, much in the way of financial in, uh, incentives through that designation, right? Uh, it was more about, they thought the timeline might be faster, the Act 250, I mean, they're not in Act 250, the permitting process might be sped up, and there was a modest uh, relief in the form of an estimate of $33,000 in fees uh, that did not have to be paid. Um, but ARPA money, uh, JFO keeps reminding us, the origin of the ARPA money, the reason for its existence to begin with was relief from impacts of COVID. And we know that lower income Vermonters who also have the hardest time getting affordable housing, safe, affordable housing, um, were also disproportionately impacted by COVID. So what I would like to explore with the committee is a notion of if we're going to do ARPA funded housing, that we make it more affordable for more people for longer. Um, because if affordability uh, and stability is really our goal, then um, I'd be interested in exploring something with a committee that's much more like the original parameters around affordability. And those two parameters are how long does a unit stay affordable before it can go into the market-based market pricing? And the second one is how, what percentage of the development needs to be affordable in order to qualify. You, know, you might say the ARPA ones should be 100% or it might be mixed income. Some are market-based, some are quote unquote affordable. So that's the, I just wanted to offer that up to the committee because I think to the degree that we're being asked to uh, yield Act 250 review, which we all know is an important tool um, let's see what, what we're gaining sort of in response to that give, you know, it is a quid pro quo of sorts, but, and it's more than that. It's really that if we're really going to be, I think, serious about supporting housing, let's truly make it affordable housing. So 
I'm, I've gone on a little longer than I planned. What I'd just like to hear from other people in the committee, what goes through your mind is I talk about that stuff. Uh, Senator McCormick. Well, um, Senator McDonald has, has driven the point home several times and I agree with them that the that 15 years is not much to get for our trouble and uh, is not gonna provide as, as much of a benefit as I think we want to provide to low. And I'm actually even not, even, at this point, it's not just low income, it's, it's moderate income people as well. I mean, housing has become prohibitively expensive for folks who are otherwise doing, doing okay. Um, the, uh, but while, while I have the, the committee's attention, I want to just respond to uh, Mr. Chairman. You, you mentioned that uh, the idea, my idea of an umbrella permit did not have many takers. And my, my sense is that uh, we have not had many takers in our discussions. People have not come forward and said, yes, please do this. I think we would have takers if we were to do this. I think what's happening now is that people look for the path of least resistance. And uh, if the focus is solely on, on getting as many uh, developments up as possible in downtown, as much housing as possible in downtown. And I think we're all for that. It's not as though I'm uh, stressing environmental protection as opposed to housing. I think what, what we're looking for is to, is to do a hat, hat trick here and have both. Uh, the, uh, but if people are focused primarily on the housing and not really paying a lot of attention to the benefits of environmental um, protection, then the path of least resistance is it, really the real path of least resistance would just be repeal Act 250 altogether. And there have been people who have wanted to do that for 50 years. Um, but uh, uh, my sense is that that um, they're going for that. Not, not a repeal, but I mean, they're going for a, a path of less resistance than I for one would like to offer. But I think what I'm suggesting would work. It would provide that benefit uh, while preserving uh, 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 environmental review as well. And if that were available, then people would take it. If that was the path, the, not the path of least resistance totally in the universe, but the path of least resistance available to them under Vermont law, I think they would take it. And I think if, and I can't, I don't have any science there. I, uh, I think it's worth a try. I think a lot of what we're doing, of course, governing in general, I think is a lot of it is speculative. It's, let's see if it works. And um, so I, that's, uh, I actually was gonna wait to talk, but I noticed the rest of the committee was silent and I felt sorry for you, Mr. Chairman. So I figured I'd give you- <laughs> don't, feel, don't feel sorry for me. Uh, um, the, uh, but thank you. Okay. Um, Senator McDonald, you weighed in on this some. Do you wanna say anything more? I, I, I thought, Mr. Chair, you you summarized it um, more gently um, than I would have, and um, I didn't um, use but, the word eviction, but right? no differently in it, no differently in its content. Um, and I, I, I was reminded as you were speaking about the last housing bill we did a couple of years ago with uh, forty years of bonding, and in the last five years of bonding, the people that we thought we were building it for. Maybe may find themselves evicted, and uh, if if that's the case, I'm embarrassed. Uh, if that's not the case, I am. Uh, I, I feel much better. But in the, I, I'm glad that you have spoken with, uh, I believe, the chair of uh, of commerce, housing, and Gen and community affairs. And that we have the opportunity here to coordinate and and see that the goals that we all speak to are more likely to be realized, um, and we're not just opening the, the gates to more of a, more of the same when it comes to 
subsidizing the private enterprise so that they can um, make a token effort to deal with our housing crisis for the people at the, who are, are affected by COVID, who, who've watched uh, available housing being gobbled up by folks from down country that are coming up here to buy a second or you know, an insurance place to live. Um, and we should make that part of our overall um, uh, goal here. So thank you. Well, thank you. And you're reminding me, uh, Senator McDonald, um, it, this actually came up as an impromptu meeting at the end of yesterday. So let me report out to the committee that I met with the chair of economic development and the pro tem uh, yesterday to just discuss the housing related piece that we're talking about now, ARPA funded housing, and also, you know, pathways for a bill to move forward, best way to do it. Uh, Senator Sorotkin's interested in possibly having our bill go and become literally part of the omnibus housing bill, uh, as opposed to a standalone bill. Um, I don't have a particularly strong feelings one way or the other, what it's called, where it travels. Uh, I'm just interested in placing it in the most advantageous position to get to the governor's desk and, and win a signature, because uh, I think there's important work in there. Um, Senator Campin, I saw you looking like you were about to say something. I don't know if you have anything to well, say. My, my question was whether or not uh, you had had an opportunity to talk with Senator Sorokin about this. And it sounds like <clears throat> you have, uh, you know, I, I, I can see some advantages to, to tucking the two together um, myself, you know, sending it as one bill, but I'll leave that to uh, to minds better than mine as to whether or not that is is the best approach. Okay. Um, and Mr. Vice Chair, Senator Westman? I think the idea of sticking to the ARPA money with the idea of a pilot around the ARPA money in, in doing something makes sense. I um, um, agree with Senator McDonald that 15 years isn't um, a very long time. And if with this ARPA money, we um, made a push for something longer. That wouldn't be a bad thing to do. I would also say, though, um, and Senator um, McCormick brought it up, I think it's become very unaffordable for middle class families okay. that aren't in those traditional categories that we talk about for low income. And I'm worried about them. I'm seeing houses um, in my area that um, on my road, I just saw a house that in the late 90s sold for um, $98,000 and it's tiny. It's un under, it's like 800 square feet sold for nearly $400,000. And it was bought by somebody from away. And I don't know what middle class young people that are trying to buy their first house, where they're going to go. Right. And um, so, I, so it isn't just the low income, but that might be too much for us to do in a bill like this. I am worried about them. Yeah. Well, thank you. Me too. I share the concern. Um, I know, you know, in our weatherization work, we talk often about the people 80% AMI to 120. So 120, someone might say, well, you're 20% above area median income, you should be fine. But in fact, no. those are often very stressed families as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and the term I've heard in the last six months that's floated out is the missing middle, you know. Um, and so I, I, I think that would be another sort of design opportunity for what we're talking about with ARPA funded housing that it includes this missing middle. Um, I can, yeah. If there's an opportunity, I think if we do the ARPA money as a pilot to maybe get a stake in the ground. So. Yeah, great. Uh, Senator McDonald. Uh, uh, Senator Westman is absolutely correct. We, one of the other things we talked about last night was that while we're talking about um, that, it, it, it's common that in these projects, only 20% of the 
housing units goes to the people at, at the lower income levels, the ones who are only guaranteed a, a 15 year window, that um, part of these projects does address the, the, the missing middle because 80% of the units are um, remaining, what remaining to be, that are part of the construction projects. And we should take a look at those to make sure that those are not all going for, um, to address the, the group that uh, Senator Westman was talking about. Right. As, right. I mean, that's, that is, should be our, also be our focus. And um, right. we are remiss in not having mentioned that to begin with, yep. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just think the whole housing market has changed. And the COVID stuff is really just blown it all out of the water. Um, yeah, if, if it's ARPA funded and ARPA is about COVID relief and moderate and uh, lower income Vermonters are the most impacted, then you know it, it's, it's not a crazy starting point to say, well, shouldn't 100% of the units be um, mixed income, you know, affordable? It, it, you could work your way down from there, but it's it is a reasonable place to start at. How we would you know how we ever ended up at only twenty percent? I honestly don't know the history, but it it's been pared down to, to you know one fifth. It's not, um, but that's a different project. So we have a chance, as Senator Usman said, to pilot something different. Okay, well, great. Well, it's just for me, you know, I'm really worried about people that are like 60,000 household a year to maybe 120. You know, if, if they can sell an 800 square foot home just up the road from me in the, on, on dirt road in, which is a pretty small town and it goes for 400, how does somebody that's making 80,000 a year that's got college debt afford that? Right, right, right. Okay, well, great. So this has been very helpful in terms of, I, I'm gonna work with Ellen to try to craft language that picks up on these concerns and talks about, you know, uh, an ARPA funded housing pilot that is more supportive of uh, moderate and lower income Vermonters and use the different variables we've just been talking about, longevity and percentage of the construction that includes those units. Uh, and then let's see what it looks like. Um, okay, so okay. it's 10 yes. o'clock and... Senator Bray, um, Ms. Davis said she's at Joint Health and will be here momentarily. Okay. So, um, great. Um, Is that sell during mud season or summertime? <laughs> what was that, Senator McDonald? I was wondering about the house up the road from Senator Westman, whether that sold it during mud season or in the summertime. It sold sight unseen. Oh, I've, I've, I have had. I have met people that bought similar houses and under similar circumstances. And I was surprised that, and they didn't grumble. You know. Oh, and, and what I'd I say is, my head. <laughs> what, what I'd say yeah. is it, um, the road that they bought on, if you come in April, it's not fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's it's one of those roads. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, good morning, Ms. Davis. Thanks for joining us. Um, so we've uh, asked you to come visit with us this morning to talk about S-148, the, uh, the environmental justice bill, and um, wanted to hear your thoughts about it more generally, but also we have a specific question as we've looked at sort of the nuts and bolts of it. It has an advisory council and it has an interagency committee. Um, and so I'll uh, 
just include the question of whether or not you would recommend that your office be on one, on the other, or maybe in the unusual spot of being both, where you would end up, I think, maybe serving a liaison function from mainstream government committee to also the advisory council. So I've, I've put my cards on the table there. That's the, that's the nuts and bolts question. But of course, we're more interested. We're also interested in, in hearing your thoughts on the bill more generally. So good morning. And it's good to see you. I think it's been a year or something since we last saw you. Good morning, buenos dias. It has been quite a while since I've seen several of you. So thank you for uh, having me in. And I'll, I'll be brief because you have heard so much about this bill yeah. and you have heard a lot of it from people with lived experience, people of color, people living in underserved areas. And I think that these are communities who should speak on their own behalf. So I'm not gonna step over their testimony, but I will just say that I am um, extremely excited about how the bill has shaped up. And um, this, is, this is a lot of work. This is a very ambitious charge. And I imagine we'll probably get some of it right and it'll be great. And we'll probably get some of it wrong and it'll be a catastrophe. But, um, but I, I am fully committed to being engaged throughout the process. Senator, to, or Mr. Chair, to your specific question, I'll just go ahead and answer it now. I'm greedy, let's take both. Yes. Um, you know, the, the work is, it's important that we have equity as part of the foundational approach from the outset. Right. It is easiest to accomplish just outcomes when you have just inputs. And so making sure that we are at the table often and early and really saturating the dialogue is important. So. I see the Racial Equity Office having a role on the interagency, in the agent, interagency work. Um, we also, we are in the process of onboarding our second staff person who's a policy and research analyst. And I imagine that person will, will have an important, um, will have a big, a big piece of that portfolio. And then also with the advisory council. And again, you know, the advisory council is, is gonna be a mixed group of people some of whom may be in government or government adjacent, and some of whom are not. I believe very much in process equity, and I think that if the council will have us as a racial equity office involved, then we want to be there too. Yes. Um, and the reason that I frame it that way is because oftentimes I think that anything having to do with race, ethnicity, or any other protected category, we often assume that we want, we want the racial equity director to be there and we assume everyone else does too. Or we want the human rights commission executive director there and we assume everyone else does too. And I genuinely hope that that's always the case, but sometimes it's not. And I think that it's more important to be responsive to those needs rather than to um, get to be in every space I want to be in just because I want to be in it. Uh, this is a year for me that I'm trying to uh, be intentional about what impact I'm having on people around me. So that said, it is my preference that the Racial Equity Office be present in both the Advisory Council space and also in the interagency work space. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, great. Well, thank you for, for that. I mean, as we talked about it, thought about it, it seemed as though it could be very valuable to have someone who's working in both spaces steadily from the outset because of the continuity uh, on, you know, and, and making sure that the message gets through so that you end up having a liaison function on top of your roles just in those committees. And um, great. The, I think the other concern we had is that, um, you, are we sort of swamping your office with requests, you know, like, and um, how does this fit in with the many, I think, I'm guessing you get a lot of asks for uh, participation or assistance on various ways, different committees, councils, et cetera. It's, it's seem manageable. And, and I'll, the second half of that is we always in this committee say, if we're asking you to do something, we don't expect people just to stretch themselves thinner and thinner. 
if you need resources, we ask you to help us, you know, I, identify it, quantify it, and then we can go to bat on behalf of your, your operating area to get the resources you need to be successful. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. Uh, yes, it is swamping. No, it is not manageable, but we need it. And um, I would rather be swamped with all the requests so that we know the full need mm -hmm. rather than shrink our involvement in all of the places where inequity presents itself simply due to something like bandwidth. Right. Because we can, we can rectify that, but if there's a need in a particular sector or workflow, then we're gonna, let's, let's try for it. So I appreciate you saying that, thank you. I do know that um, some of your colleagues in um, adjacent committees and also in the House are considering some measures like the creation of the Division of Racial Justice Statistics, which would add a considerable amount to the workload, but also would come with um, a commensurate staffing to support it. And so these are some of the ways that I can envision us building out that infrastructure so that we can um, manage all of the acts. So thank you for, for raising that concern. Okay. Um, and also you should be hearing, if you have not yet heard from uh, the Joint Fiscal Office, they're putting together a fiscal note for the bill. So reaching out to every operating area and saying, if you were to participate in the full implementation, I mean, this will happen over years, but at any rate, implementing S-148, um, what are the impacts to your operating area fiscally? And uh, so that we can make sure that we move forward this session with a realistic picture of what that will take. I suspect that will be, you know, there'll be an, an initial investment and then that will actually grow over time as areas develop more mature, fully fledged programs, agency by agency, department by department. Um, uh, it, I, I also wanna pause and just say, um, we, have, we have some questions, but are, are there, I just wanna make sure that if there's anything on your mind that hasn't come up yet and you say, oh, I wanted to touch on that, feel free to um, offer any other comments while you're here. You know, I have been, uh, in reading the bill, one thing that always sticks out to me, and I know this is actually a conversation that you all have had as well, but one thing that kind of struck me when I read it was the term environmental justice population. Mm -hmm. I don't like it. Yeah. Uh huh. I view uh, uh, it is. Yeah. There, it's a, there's this. Well, I know what I think. Let me say, can you say a little more about that? Yeah. So I think about the ways in which we title things and the connotations that flow from the nomenclature. Did we have a trial, uh, you know, thinking about a couple of high profile court cases that happened over the last year. For example, the Derek Chauvin trial, mm -hmm. that was the name of the person on trial, the officer. Right. But then concurrently, there was the Amart Aubrey trial. That was the name of the murder victim. Right. We have, Alliterative terms for people who do embarrassing things in public, permit patty, barbecue Becky, other strange terms that not only satirize the issues behind them, but also that allow bad actors to be anonymous. Uh -huh. I don't know what permit patty's real name is. She gets to sort of hide from that in some senses. Yeah. And and so then I also think about what someone somewhere termed the euphemism treadmill. And we look at the ways in which terms evolve and take on new and old connotations over time. I know I'm rambling, it'll, it'll come yeah. to a point. Um, you know, for example, in the United States, there were terms many years ago of um, like, uh, like crippled. And then we said, well, that has a negative connotation. Let's change that to handicapped. And then handicapped took on the same connotation as, as crippled. And so now we have words like 
disabled. Right. But that feels disempowering as well. So now some folks say differently able. And, and it's the pattern here, and this happens all the time. I just saw a new, somebody just pointed out to me, BIMPOC, B-I-M-P-O-C, Black, Indigenous, Mixed, and People of Color. I, I don't know that I can support the weight of many more letters on my shoulders to describe uh -huh. me. And so when I think about terms like the justice population or the justice involved or the environmental justice population, or when we talk about diverse candidates, is it that I am a diverse person or is it that our workforce is made more diverse with my presence? I am not the diverse one. We become diverse together when you have more of me. So similarly, when I think about populations that are described by that term, it seems to me that People subject to injustice are referred to as a justice population. And it's not clear to me that they are justice people. They're just people right. who are repeatedly on the receiving end of systemic barriers. And so I wonder if titling them with the name, I mean, it's almost like saying the affirmative action student. Mm -hmm. I, don't think, I don't think people want to be defined by the injustices that other people inflict upon them. And so this just, the term environmental justice population just tastes bad to me. Yeah. I don't, I do not presently have a recommendation for you, but I know we could find one. Okay. Well, thank you for that. It is odd. <laughs> we would all hope that we live in a just society. So it's kind of peculiar to identify people as having been the recipients of uh, an unjust policies. You know, it's like, it, it's an odd kind of negative labeling. So I understand your point. I mean, practically speaking, uh, we're trying to move the bill in a timely way. So, uh, but the bill has to go entirely through the house as well. So maybe this is uh, one of the things that can come back to the fore and really be thought through in a, a more positive way. And I encourage you to stay in touch with us and others. And because I appreciate what you're making us Con consider re and reconsider because it is something kind of awkward. I mean, there's there's three factors that are listed, and then if you can check any box, then you're in the population. Uh, I'm, I'm not so sure that everyone that would quote unquote be in that population would feel like, oh, I'm in I'm in that same group. Uh, I don't know that people would self identify as um, mm. an EJ person. It, it seems it uh, awkward and probably more seriously negative than I realize in a way. Senator McCormick. Thank you. Um, Madam Director, uh, I, I, continuing this, this conversation, I, uh, I've always enjoyed being a skeptic on language. I think a lot of our jargon is, is unproductive and just, you know, politically correct, well, that's an outdated term now, but because the right ruined it. <laughs> but uh, but I, I do think there are some uh, terms, you know, that actually do improve the language. I have stopped referring to slave owners and slaves and referred to enslavers and enslaved people, because I think it does make the distinction you were just talking about. Um, I also prefer differently abled because we're all disabled. I mean, I can't fly. I can't outrun a Greyhound. There's all sorts of things I can't do, but I'm not defined by them. Uh, and uh, I have a friend who's on the autism spectrum and his powers of concentration are spectacular. And it's definitely connected with his autism. So, uh, uh, but I, I do think that we are often not selective enough in the um, improved terms we use. So thank you for bringing that to our attention. And I think we should watch out for that. There are times when it's just patronizing and I feel 
a little embarrassed by it. Um, I do have a, 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 a sorry. I, I don't know if you want to say more on that. I do have another question no, for you. I was just registering my agreement with the Senator. Thank you for your comment. Okay. Um, another issue we've talked about in committee um, and looked at some language today um, relates to a, the notion of a stipend for people on the advisory council. And um, I, we have so many councils, boards, et cetera, where people are paid either per diem and in some cases nothing. And, um, the, and it's, um, you know, some, I guess the, what I have come to appreciate in the last year is that um, that system, um, while people appreciate the notice of the concept of volunteerism, I think probably all of us grew up in families that encouraged volunteerism, uh, but there is a certain privilege that goes along with being able to do purely voluntary work because if you have to take time away from the wage paying job you have, and there's no wage replacement, then your volunteerism comes at a cost and it may be too high a cost and it may preclude you from actively participating. So knowing that we have this whole array of uh, boards, commissions, et cetera, where we're only paying the per diem, we're trying to figure out a system to support the advisory council more fully. And I don't know if you have experience with that and can recommend models to this committee, other states, other programs where um, they've been able to figure out how to do that well. Yeah, you know, I recognize that in Vermont, a lot of the important policy work that happens at the state level often happens through boards and commissions by people, many of whom are retired, semi-retired, unpaid, or underpaid. I think about some of these groups like the racial disparities in the criminal and juvenile justice systems advisory panel, putting in hours and hours of work over the course of multiple years to generate a report that ends up being picked apart in committee, if it's read. And thinking about um, all of what we're asking members of this proposed advisory council to do and to perform on a regular and ongoing basis. It is important that we compensate people fairly for their work. I know that the state has a meeting per diem amount. I also know that for a while it's been discussed as being too low. And, um, and I know that that's a conversation that's still ongoing about what is fair compensation. We also have a certain reality. This is a very small state. And so we don't have a $97 billion budget so we have to be judicious about what we're doing. I say this often, if we believe that, if we really believe in work and if we really take it seriously, then we're gonna tangibly and meaningfully invest in it. Now, what does that mean? A lot of times we look to things like philanthropy or uh, public-private partnerships, which certainly can be effective here. Um, I know of a few entities in the state of Vermont who have already expressed the desire to get more involved in ecological justice, they might be a great fit for it because they basically have money to burn and don't know what policy to do. And here we have a group that has policy ideas, but needs to have it funded. Seems like a perfect match. Right. The thing that I would say though, is particularly when it comes to environmental issues, we have to be extremely judicious about whom we are selecting as partners. Mm -hmm. Because this is one of the, sectors in which good policy often, most often gets thwarted and undermined by money interests involved. It deeply saddens me that when I see an advertisement for dish soap, the image they use is a duck covered in oil. We're the best at removing oil from animals in the wild when an oil spill happens. Uh -huh. Because that basically tells us we're taking oil spills as a given. That's just going to happen in life. So why not get the best dish soap to deal with it, one duck at a time? And when we do that, what we're effectively doing is saying there are certain people whom we're not going to hold accountable for the bad environmental stuff. We're just going to try to work around it and market around it and organize around it. And so oftentimes it's because some of those big players and 
I'm going to say this and then I'm going to start hearing clicks on my phone again, but some of those big players have all their money into a lot of these processes and end up dictating what policy gets advanced and what doesn't. Okay. So I think that a perhaps a philanthropic partnership might be appropriate here, even though, again, this is squarely government's function to fund the work that it's demanding. However, where we can get that assistance, that could be helpful, but I would just say we really have to vet all of our partners because ecological justice is one of the areas where progress can be stymied the most because of many things, because of things like nimbyism at the micro level or just a good lobbying group at the macro level. And it is very easy um, to see groups sell out. Um, right. For lack right. of a better thing. Right. Well, somehow, as you say, though, this, it reminds me of the posters from the v Vietnam War era where it said, why not make the Department of Defense hold a bake sale? You know, like, uh, w why, <laughs> why does the, why, why do we unquestionably fund sort of the mainstream uh, business as usual model? But if you're leaning towards something more progressive, um, that then you're scrambling for the, your funds. And I think that it comes back down to budgets express values. Correct. I completely agree, Mr. Chair. And I think that a lot of that comes down to the, again, the, the ways in which we're approaching the work and what the ultimate goal is. Are we starting with an equity impact assessment or an environmental impact assessment or a health impact assessment? And also when we do our analyses of political or economic or social impact, are we looking for profit? Are we looking for what's going to pay or are we looking to do what's right? It is incumbent upon me that I always remember and remind others that we're talking about land use policies on territory that was never ours. It was stolen and it continues to be occupied by settler culture. And so when we think about what is environmental justice, we're doing it from the framework of a sovereign state that was plopped down on top of a sovereign nation. And so we just have a lot of, we have to go back to square zero with the way that we think and not look for profit and not assume that we have certain rights or authorities that we've always taken as a given um, but that perhaps from a real justice perspective deserve to be questioned. Right. That does not give you anything concrete, but I think it just had to be said anyway. Yep. Well, food for thought, right? So we, we know that this bill, you know, we're always saying the, our bills are just a blueprint. Then you got to go build the building. Then the people need to move in. Then the thing needs to start working and doing things. And right now we're only at the blueprint stage. So Thank you. Um, any last committee comments or questions? We have in three minutes of joint assembly, um, but uh, in the Zoom world, three minutes is plenty of time for travel. Yeah. Okay, so Senator McDonald, then Senator McCormick. Um, uh, always dangerous to walk into uh, strange territory. 6% um, of the population is generally reviewed to as a uh, special interest group and we talk about them. 62% um, of the population is a majority and we talk about us. Um, mm -hmm. In reading this bill, I ask, uh, should the bill be crafted to the best of our ability in such a way that its press coverage and social media presence is viewed as an us bill for the majority or, um, look at as being looked at in those places as a them bill and a special interest group. And I, I think we know what would be the option that would get us the most support and have it, um, have it move forward effectively. And how do we get there? Um, mm -hmm. Given that the the, when it comes out and it's voted on, it's gonna fall into one of those categories or the other. 
or the other? How do we get it into the category that makes it a, um, we're all in this together, Bill, because that's one way to read it. And that's the way I hope it would be um, perceived. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. That is a question that I wish we could actually spend two hours talking about because <laughs> you're entirely right. I mean, women are discussed as a special interest group and we're 51% of the population here and globally. So, you know, yes. it, and I think that, and the answer is, it should be described neither as a them bill nor as an us bill, but rather as an everybody bill. And what we've got to do really is just reject that, it, it reinforce that there is a collective benefit to equity. Absolutely, everybody who's currently in a position of, um, uh, in, a, in a dominant group is still gonna benefit from things that are directed at people from historically marginalized groups or smaller quote unquote minority groups. It's how it works in this country, right? Civil rights era was uh, largely with the black American community in mind, but every white person in this country has benefited from it, period, end of story. The largest beneficiary group of affirmative action policies in employment and in education is white women. So I think that while I, I, I recognize and respect the question, because we want this to be well received, we want it to be well viewed, and we want it to be widely accepted. Um, but I also think this is an opportunity for us to move away from the them us paradigm and um, kind of grab people by the shoulders figuratively and shake them and say, this is everybody. <laughs> and it matters. And you can't have property rights or um, you, you can't have your, your zoning ordinances or your creamy stands or whatever it is if there's no planet on which to plant it. So that's gotta come first. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Chair, I, just, I thank the witness because she's, she is correct. <laughs> and we live in a majority, which is a, 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 we have a majority form of government. And so we're stuck in, a, in, in, in both sides of this issue. And um, that is the question that we face in life. So I thank you. Okay. So we have run over, I apologize. Um, uh, and Do I have 10 seconds? 10 seconds. Oh, Thank you. <laughs> Could you please send us a memo elaborating on something you said in your opening remarks that there are parts of this bill you love and parts that you think are a disaster. Just outline what, we, what you would have us pay attention to in that regard. Well, Thanks. Um, Senator, I want to clarify um, what I what I said was that there we're going to get some of it right and it's going to be great and we're going to get some of it wrong uh, and it's going to be a disaster. Not not components of the bill or its provisions, but just in the rollout and in, in practice. But I will send you all a memo of some more thoughts that I have on specific provisions of the bill. Okay. Well, thank you. I figure the bill is going to be a learning experience and it's going to develop organically for years to come that, or the implementation. And that's what we'll, we'll keep on aiming to improve. So thanks so much for your visit. Good to see you again. We'll look forward to your um, further thoughts in writing and um, 